I'm Jack Tishner, and welcome to Illinois Lawmakers. Rich Miller of CapitalFacts.com is with us here in the House Speaker's Gallery as the clock ticks down to midnight on May 31st. So as we sit here today on Thursday, the House and Senate have all the pieces together for their own budget, meaning a Democratic budget, $36.3 billion, and not enough revenue to get the thing, uh, to pay for the thing. Yeah, they're about $4 billion short on revenue right now. Um, this, if you look at it from 10 miles up, is really not a bad uh, situation. This budget that they're passing could be used as a template for the final package. The governor has already said that he could agree to $3.5 billion in revenue. So they're really not that far apart. The problem, obviously, is that the governor wants to get some other things accomplished here. And this has been one lost opportunity after another throughout this session uh, that they haven't been able to come to agreement on even some things on, on workers' compensation or unemployment insurance or whatever else. Mm -hmm. Because in, 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 in the recent days leading up to where we are now, the House has picked off those things one after another. The Senate has taken up a more limited number of things like workers' comp and tort reform. Those have gone down going nowhere. Right, and I think it's clear that both sides have wanted this thing to go into overtime. I, I, I think that the governor has been very strident for months about labor unions. Uh, I think he was attempting, in, in one part, way, of moving the conversation to the right so that he could then get some of the other stuff. And all that did, though, was harden everybody on the left. And I think the speaker had decided early on that this thing uh, was going to go in overtime. He didn't really care. And that's where it's going and right now. Is unless something drastic changes, that's where they're heading. So what's the end game? Get it? Get us into June or July or September, and every everybody comes back. I'm not kidding point? about September. September, really? Why? Because Why because I don't think that they'll have money. That a lot of schools will have enough money to open their doors come August, September. Because right and now, and I think they're going to wait for that or at least get close to that because, deadline. Because the first school aid payments come August 10th and August uh, 20th, I believe. Correct. But the first blown paychecks for state workers comes July 15th. Now, who knows what's going to happen there? I mean, the controller could go to a court like Dan Hines, the former controller, did. But the governor back then didn't oppose the motion to get the state employees paid. We don't know whether this governor, who's not exactly pro-state employee, will impose will oppose that motion. Well, and you, you've been you've been uh, talking about some things in your blog about the possibility of a, of a strike over the summer. It's state possible. Employees. Um, I mean, they're farther apart, believe it or not. AFSCME and the governor are further apart than Mike Madigan and the governor. Um, much further apart. And that's 38,000 state employees with AFSCME. Pume, yeah. So, as, as we say, so we're, we're coming up to that midnight deadline. Unless something drastic happens, we're going to be here off and on throughout the summer. Correct. I don't think it'll be like it was under Blagojevich, where we were here for days and days and days at a time. Um, I, I just don't see that happening. One reason is I think the rounder people understand if you bring them to town, you have to share the stage with them. If they're not in town, they're spread out all over, legislators meaning, they're spread out all over the state, all the attention is on you, and uh, you can spin that towards yourself. Interesting viewpoint, and there's another dynamic here too. The legislative leadership doesn't want people here with nothing to do on their, you know, nothing on their, nothing to do. Right, and they and they don't get any uh, uh, per diem, a daily right. paycheck, uh, in overtime. So, unless the governor calls them in for a special session. Very interesting, Rich. Thanks very much. I appreciate thanks for the time. Me. Up next on the program, a newsmaker interview with Senate President John Cullerton. Joining us now on Illinois Lawmakers, Democratic Senate President John Cullerton of Chicago. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me on. Well, as we tick down the final minutes and hours into uh, Sunday night's May 31st adjournment date, there's a process going on now here between the House and Senate Democrats of crafting your own version of a budget, I believe $36.3 billion. Um, and uh, there's no talk right now of really advancing the governor's turnaround agenda. 
Well, first of all, um, I've worked with Republican governors in the past, and I've been here some time. And normally, the Republican governor proposes a, a budget. Uh, it's sponsored by members of his party, and we negotiate it throughout the year. But this year, the governor proposed a budget. It wasn't even close to being balanced, and none of his members advanced the, their bill. So we, the Democrats, knowing that the budget's the most important thing we do down here, had to advance a budget ourselves. So we hope that at some point in time, Republicans would join with us in, in supporting it. Uh, so that's why we are advancing a budget. Uh, we, we will have finished today by uh, finishing, passing that budget. And it is a uh, little, little over $36 billion. Uh, it has our priorities, which some of which are very similar to Governor Rauner. He wants to spend more money on elementary and secondary education. We do that. Uh, but we, at the same time, uh, could not pass his unbalanced budget. Uh, his unbalanced budget uh, didn't pay our pension payments, for example. Um, it slashed uh, human services. Um, it cut higher ed by 31%. We needed to restore those uh, those things, and so that's what we did. What happened in those <clears throat> those working groups that were working on everything from the budget to new revenues to uh, workers' compensation yeah. reform? So, unrelated to the budget, the governor has these uh, items that he's uh, that we're f familiar with. We've been around here a while. He, it's new to him, and he had these ideas for changes, which is fine, uh, but he never put them in bill form. So, not until the last week. So. A few days ago, they introduced these bills dealing with workers' compensation and tort reform, and we're hearing them right now in committee, but it's a few, only a few days left. Uh, it would have been much better for him to have introduced, introduced those bills as, as bills uh, earlier in the year, and we could have debated them. Oh, we're in the House chambers right now, and here the Speaker Madigan took the approach of, well, I haven't seen your legislation yet, so I can't really vote on that, but let's run out what we know about your ideas for, right. uh, let's say, right to work zone, so on and so forth. And uh, all of those went down in, into the Well, feet. that was, the, I guess, to prove the point that the, the bills, that the concepts that he had on their face were not supported by even his own members of his own party. And so the way to do this is to actually introduce a piece of legislation, go to a public hearing, have debate, talk about possible amendments. Those, those meetings can then be uh, in private, if you will, and then you come up with a compromise. That's, what, that's how this place works. He, he didn't even put them in bill form until a few days ago. That, that's really the reason why the Speaker went ahead and had those votes to kind of prove that point. But he has, he has for many months now made the point that he's not going to go for any new revenues into what he considers a broken system for a number of reasons here. Part of the reasons he he says are the Democratic leadership that's mm -hmm. been entrenched here for many, many years. He says he's not going to do anything for new revenues uh, until there's some, some very substantial reform for the business climate in Illinois. Right. And that would have been then introducing legislation to prove um, his point, to see what it is that he wants to actually do for example, workers' comp reform, he may, he may not be aware of the fact we already passed the workers' comp reform about three years ago. And so we, he could have learned what that was in that bill and how it's been uh, effectively bringing down workers' comp costs. So that's the type of thing you do in a committee when you introduce legislation. And, and so failing to do that, we had to advance a budget, which we've done. The fact that he says he's willing to do revenue, you know, Governor Thompson, Governor Edgar, when we worked with them, they proposed tax increases. We passed three times. We passed taxes under those three Republican, uh, the two Republican governors. If he wants to do that, we'll be happy to work with him if that's what he wants to do. The balanced budget is not just our responsibility, it's his responsibility as well. well right now, uh, you could make the argument that neither one of the budgets that's been advanced or proposed is, is balanced because well, you're, you're $3 billion off on revenue. You don't have, you well, don't have the money That's there. what we, you know, we don't spend money. We authorize the governor to spend money. When Governor Thompson was here, we frequently uh, appropriated more money than we had. The governor would do his mandatory veto, and then we had a balanced budget. That process played out in the 80s when I was here um, uh, virtually every year. So the process isn't over. We give him a spending authority. If he thinks that it's, there's not enough money for it and he doesn't want to propose uh, uh, any taxes, all he has to do is mandatorily veto those those, those amounts down. So he goes back to what? His original budget that had $31 billion or so and enormous cuts in areas like Medicaid and human services? And not only that, it wasn't even balanced even with those cuts. So he's got a big problem. But that's why we have to suggest that he would do what previous Republican governors did when we had super majorities of Democrats. 
offer us a plan for a balanced budget. That's what we're willing to do and willing to work with him on. And as far as his turnaround agenda, now that you've introduced the bills, we'll have hearings. We'll see if there's any common ground that we can reach with those. Um, passing anything after May 31st is going to require a supermajority in both the House and Senate. Uh, you have those on paper in the House and Senate, uh, uh, 71 here in the House. Uh, I, have a, I have it in, in practice in the Senate. Yeah, you, you have it in effect over there. But you, you, you're going to insist upon, I believe, Republicans being part of any well, votes sure. on cuts or new yeah, revenues? Sure. That's why we can still get things done after uh, May 31st, because we'll if you have an agreement with Republicans, then you have uh, the ability to pass a bill with three fifths vote. Are, are, aren't the Democrats still going on something of a limb here because you've got an unbalanced budget proposal here and you're rejecting some popular ideas that the governor has, like term limits and redistricting reform, and the governor's got something you don't have, a $34 million war chest that he can start running ads against the Democrats right after this thing falls off. I don't, I don't know what those ads would say. Yeah. Uh, uh, that'll be interesting because uh, maybe he's not going to say in his ads that he failed to offer a balanced budget. As far as those uh, constitutional amendments that he's proposed, we virtually always hear those in the second half of the two-year legislative session because that's when the deadline is to put constitutional amendments on the ballot and we'll take those up next year. So you're, you're basically looking at a situation here where everyone's going to go home at some time around midnight on, on Sunday night and uh, there'll be some time to kind of cool off a little bit, we hope, and sure. then is it conceivable that uh, targeted numbers or members of the legislature and the staff will come back and start talking in the following weeks? I'm more than happy to do that. We're happy to have the governor look at the budget, see what he likes about it, what he doesn't like about it. Uh, we can talk to him some more about his uh, turnaround agenda. Uh, maybe if he comes up with actual pieces of legislation, we could have hearings and continue to negotiate with them. But how long can this go, Senator Cullerton? I mean, you're looking at a number of different things. You've got uh, the first state paychecks that uh, would be at risk would be like uh, July 15th. The first uh, state aid payments to schools comes August 10th and August 20th. How long can this go before you really have to have revenues in place in a doctor? We would have offered uh, authorization for the governor to spend money. He's the governor of the state. He's responsible for those programs. Uh, he's the one that spends. We authorize. We would have done our job. So it would be up to him to decide whether to veto or uh, sign those pieces of legislation. Once he acts, we will, we will then react and then we'll see where we are. I haven't asked you about pensions, of course, and the pension reform bill, the Senate Bill 1 that came through here about three years ago, has been shot down by the Illinois Supreme Court. Uh, you kind of dusted off an idea that you had earlier. I believe it was Senate Bill 2404. It wasn't an idea. It was, it was, an it was a bill. bill. It was an actual bill. An actual bill that passed yeah, 2404. Yeah, with 40 votes and was a constitutional way to save a lot of money. Had it passed, uh, it would have been the law. The, the, the people who sued were in agreement with that bill. There wouldn't even have been a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, now I offer to anybody uh, the path for a constitutional uh, version of pension reform, which will save about a billion dollars a year. Uh, I've talked to the governor about it. He's mulling it over. Uh, I've talked to the unions uh, who won the lawsuit. They're mulling it over. But it looks like nothing's going to happen right now. And it hinges on the idea of consideration. Uh, as I understand it, uh, you could forego your future raises and... Uh, not your future raises. Uh, raises. Right. Your future raises would not be pensionable. Pensionable, right. That's that's what the, the key is. You, the, you, people, you can get future raises and we mm -hmm. can condition those raises by saying they're not going to be part of your final pension. That's one option. The other option is to lower your 3% uh, compounded COLA and take a, take a, a simple COLA. Either way, the system saved money, it's constitutional, and uh, it would uh, alleviate again, save about a billion dollars a year. And uh, that's that's still a huge problem you've got to make because you've built in, for example, in your budget, uh, making the full pension payment. We have, the law says you have to make yep. the full pension payment. We're, we're not going to change that law. That's how we got in trouble, by not fully paying our pensions. We've been doing that consistently for about 10 years in a row now, uh, huge amounts. So that's why the systems are actually getting better, not worse. About 30 seconds left. Is Chicago going to get a casino to alleviate some of the problems they have there? We have passed casino legislation out of both chambers in the past. Uh, I'm all in favor of it because of the geography of the state. We could take a lot of money from Indiana and bring it into Illinois. So, I, But it's like 
thread and a needle. There's so many different moving parts. Thank you. Senator Cullerton, we always appreciate your time on Illinois Lawmakers. Up next uh, in the program, we're going to talk to two uh, lawmakers from the rank and file in the trenches, so to speak, about how this uh, session is coming to what may be an end and may not be an end. How is the battle over the budget and the governor's turnaround agenda playing out across the state and across party lines? Well, to discuss that, we have Democratic Senator Iris Martinez of Chicago and Republican State Representative David Rice of St. Marie here for that discussion. The, the House and Senate Democrats right now are working on their own budget. It's a $36.3 billion budget, and uh, they're passing that, saying that we, we just didn't see any agreement on the governor's uh, agenda for turning around Illinois with his business reforms. We need to get the budget out here as, as this thing uh, runs, runs out the clock before midnight Sunday. How, how did that turnaround agenda play in your area of Chicago and then in your area of southeastern Illinois? Well, I think that, you know, we have to respect that the people of Illinois chose, you know, a Republican governor. And I think that, you know, when you talk about an agenda, coming with an agenda, uh, looking at, as a business person that he is, on things that, that Chicago needs, I mean, that Illinois needs to change, I think that it's workable. I think we can, we can work through this. You know, it's getting late in the game. The most important thing for us right now is to get this budget going. Um, yes, there was some, no agreement with some of the things that he was. He wanted reform first. I think that along uh, all these years, we've been putting reform into place. We've done, you know, in pension. We've done it in workman's comp. You know, so there's a lot of things that I think we can continue to work on. But right now, given the time, I think it's important that we focus on the budget and send it to the governor, and and he decides what needs to to you know to come out of the budget. But right now, we're not hearing a whole lot. We're just we're just working and getting something crafted. You know, it's going to take a little bit of time. It's piece by piece, but hopefully we'll be able to get something to him, and then we can have that discussion. Representative, well, I represent nine counties in southeastern Illinois, and they went overwhelmingly for Bruce Rauner. I had counties with 80 percent approval for Bruce Rauner, and that wasn't all of his agenda at the time because he hadn't really outlined it. But they wanted change. They wanted balanced government. Um, we're pretty conservative folks down there, and you know, we spent a lot of time the last few years. Um, expanding entitlements rather than expanding opportunities for people. And I think that's something where Senator and I have a lot in common. We mm -hmm. want to provide people with opportunities and American dream, mm -hmm. and we have to have some balance. And while our friends on the other side of the aisle don't totally agree with his agenda, we all agree that we don't have enough jobs, we don't have enough opportunities for people, and government has has gotten too big. So I think we can all work together and come together and, and fix this. Your, your district in south, southeastern Illinois borders along uh, Indiana, a good deal of it there, and that's where they have right-to-work legislation in place. That's one of the governor's big items that he's been pushing. He's kind of backed off of it here in the last few days because it wasn't going anywhere. But is that a tool that would work in your area? Well, it's it mixed reviews. I think I've only had three mm -hmm. communities that have approved his, his uh, right to work agenda or his turnaround agenda. Yeah. So we're continuing to work and, and feel those communities out. But you know, the fact of the matter is, is a lot of people get in a car and they drive to Indiana every day to work. And that's unfortunate. And we lose those income tax dollars, which sometimes we lose those sales tax dollars if they buy their goods and services over there. So we need to focus on coming together with Indiana. We're never going to be Indiana. And okay. I think that's come out <laughs> in discussions here, but we can close the gap so that we're competitive. And I think that's what our focus should be. Senator, we've talked about your district that borders along Interstate 90, and you have extremely wealthy areas on one end, you have working class, and you have some very poverty areas in the, in the other. Uh, what, what parts, it sounds like some of this would appeal to the wealthier ends and not at all to the other. I think we have to keep, you know, the, everything in perspective. I mean, you know that we have major corporations have a way of doing things and being able to move, you know, forward. We have to make sure that government is there to assist the most neediest. In my district, yes, I have from the richest mansions on a boulevard to the end of those of that street, we have public housing. And there's a lot of people in those communities that really have a lot of need and a lot of necessities that government assists. You know, when you look at the budget, you, when you look at the whole entire budget and know that a certain percentage, you know, is dependent on public safety, public safety that in Chicago, you know that we are in a very critical time with all these shootings. And you have, and, and when you talk about government working for people, you know, it, it, it does work 
but we have to make sure that they're the most vulnerable are taken care of because it's only going to create a bigger problem when those individuals end up in jail, end up on you know on the streets. We have to we have to take care of the needs of the people too. You have you have urban poverty, you have rural poverty, pockets deep pockets of that in your district. I'm familiar with a lot of the areas there. Well, we have a different kind of poverty. It's just uh, people live in a. Uh, either government assistance or they have low paying jobs. We just don't have the crime in my area. Um, so I think we have some similarities there, mm -hmm. but that's where education, I think, mm -hmm. is critical for all of our districts. Let's educate our kids for the, the technology they need today to, to do the simplest mm -hmm. of jobs so that they can go provide a better opportunity for their families. But if there were to be the kinds of Medicaid cuts that were originally proposed by the governor's office, those would hit hard in, in your area as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Some of the biggest employers in my district are the hospitals. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, we, you know, we're talking about making sure that individuals have access to some type of health care, some type of assistance, so we can continue to work with them and get them back into the workforce, get them back into, you know, into, into back to school. Some of these young people are, are out on the streets. We talk about taking 18 year olds already off the rolls because of the fact that we don't, that our budget does not permit it. I don't think as parents, we don't, we don't let our kids go home at 18, 18 out and, out and just throw them on and say, you know, you're on your own. I think that's where government has to work through this budget and make sure there's dollars available to take care of those individuals. Well, let's talk about the nuts and bolts of where we are right now. The Democrats in the House and the Senate are, are basically running uh, a $36.3 billion budget, but it's about somewhere between 3 and $4 billion short on actual revenues uh, to make the thing happen. Representative Rice, uh, you know, in the Senate, uh, just yesterday, Senator Murphy, who's their, uh, uh, the Republicans' budget point man, said, how can this thing even be close to being constitutional since you don't have the revenues to, to pass the thing? Well, it's not. And if that's what ends up being the final thing, it's not constitutional. Um, I think this is a discussion maybe we should have been having in March. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, here's the high point of spending. Here's the low point of spending. Let's come together. And I think where we're really far apart on is one is trying to change the uh, business climate here in the state of Illinois. But we feel that that's going to help bring in more revenues. I mean, both people want more. Both sides out want more revenues. We don't want to raise taxes. We would like to grow the economy. So I think that's where the governor's agenda, if implemented in part, will help achieve that. And Senator, I, I don't, I don't view it that way. I think that you know, when you talk about the revenue, you talk about programs in our communities. And I'll give you a perfect example. I have a daycare, which is a daycare that the, the state provides three hundred eighty thousand dollars. These are seventy-two children that are in a daycare with our HIV, where no other daycares can take these children. The governor zeroed out that. $380,000 to assist 72 kids that are stricken or their families stricken with HIV. How can we be so irresponsible in that sense? And that's what I'm saying, that these are the things that we need to talk through. Before we look at what we're going to eliminate, let's see what these programs are doing in reality and what kind of service they're providing so these children do not end up in institutions and that the parents are able to work and provide that get, those are the kind of dollars that I'm thinking are well worth dollars. What appears to be happening is the Democrats will push this budget through, everyone will go home, then the governor has the opportunity to go uh, into that budget and either veto it entirely or do line item vetoes or reduction vetoes, and it kind of sets the stage for everybody to come back to work here mm -hmm. and uh, renew these discussions without all the pressure of May 31st. Well, we have different pressures. Uh, the city of Chicago has some big yeah. uh, pension payments to the end of June. Uh, we have the first round of payroll checks that go out July 15th or thereabouts. And then we also have a big pressure point in August uh, for the st general state aid. Right. So there are three huge pressure points coming up that I think will mm -hmm. push the talks along. So in, in your view, is it possible that in the next few weeks after this has had a chance to calm down a little bit, what has happened in the past is specific lawmakers called budgeteers come back into town. They start discussing things with the leaders, the governor's staff, Tim Nudin and all those folks. They start talking and you get a dialogue going again. Well, I, I really believe that, you know, I hope it doesn't get to that. I hope that we can do this May 31st, get it over with. But I think the most important thing is that we're able to sit down. Here's the budget. Here's what we think is we're proposing. The governor can look at it, you know, the Republicans can look at it and say, you know, we don't want these. But you know what? These, that's a decision that the governor is going to have to make and that he's going to have to look, you know, line in by line on what is important, what does impact, what's going to cost us long term, you know, even more costly, uh, uh, you know, uh, items that 
right now we can take care of. I'm hoping that May 31st we are able to pass a budget and that the governor has looked at it and has a chance to say, we're done, you know, let's move forward. But I, I think that what the representative said is very important. Those three points, you know, that's really keeping us apart, we have to really come together. Representative Rice to close. Well, it's... Um, <clears throat> It's different times, you know, one party control, I think whichever party controls government for too long tends to go in that direction. So we have balance again. Uh, my favorite line this spring has been, we're all getting to know each other. Uh, we're all still getting to know each other <laughs> May 28th, uh, I, I, and we'll continue to do so this summer. I think if I left it up to the two of you, you'd get it done. Thanks so I much. I think we would. Yes. <laughs> Senator Martinez, Representative Rice, thanks for being, us on Illinois, being with us on Illinois Lawmakers. We will be back next week to see what happened after May 31st.